we can get you there just a little bit faster. And I did create a checklist for the perfect seller appointment. Uh, this script that my team uses when we run our seller appointments. So if you're interested in purchasing it, please go to disruptors.com slash checklist. And if you get value today, please tag a friend below or share this episode right now. That way we can all grow together. And this is a live show. So please ask your questions for Dominic and Gonzalo to answer. Let's go. You guys ready? Let's We're it, ready, man. man. All right, let's just jump right into it. So 200,000 last month. What, what, how did this happen? Dude, it was a it was a super busy month. Um, you know, G put it really really cool recently. You know, through our growth pattern, um, I think last time we were here, we had just recently hit our first hundred thousand dollar month. Yeah. You know, and it was epic. It was a big celebration. The team was all excited. We were super uh, freaking excited, and um, we hit the hundred thousand dollar month, right? And then the next month was just slightly under. Then the next month was just slightly over. And then it got to the point where it was consistently over and then consistently in the mid $100,000 range. As of late, we've been in the upper $100,000 range. Um, and then our first uh, month over $200,000 was yeah. last month. It was $231,000, sweet, which was super epic. And to, to think that that's just specifically just wholesaling deals. You know, we're not flipping, we're not wholesaling. Yeah. Um, I think the last time I sent you a, a group of HUDs, there was one like retail listing in it. It was mm -hmm. a brokerage related deal. Um, but this was like really just wholesale. There might've been a co-wholesale deal in there yeah. or something like that, but it's really all wholesale related. You well, know, it, it's our lane. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's our lane and we decided to just stick with it and not veer into other realms. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's just what we're very fond of. Yeah, you, know you were gonna say? Really intentional. So I think, one of the things that the reason why it's impressive because I, I I put in here like it's just one market, mm. you know, and it's not that you guys aren't in other markets, right? But you guys crushed it in just one market, and I, you know we've had a lot of people come on the show, and they've hit some big big numbers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but usually it's around like six or seven markets. Mm -hmm. So to do that much in one market is really really impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you? Um, I mean, it's been about a year since you guys were on the show. What would you guys attribute is the biggest thing that pushed you in that direction? So. I would say number one is growing our, our sales team, mm -hmm. our acquisition team. Um, and then number two is expanding our disposition team, right? So the last time we were here, we had um, one disposition sales manager, um, and now we have two mm -hmm. disposition sales managers. Okay. Um, last time we were here, we had three acquisition managers now we have four acquisition managers and a sales manager um, that we're currently training up the sales manager. To manage manager, the other four? To manage the other four. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so let's talk about the responsibilities. Like, what is that guy responsible for? So it's funny because we... Especially if it's a new role. Yeah, it's, it's a new role. So right now, they're kind of like a fifth acquisition manager. Got so it. So right now, they're getting acclimated to our, our systems, our processes. They've been in sales for two decades yeah um but they're not in line with the real estate uh realm and, and wholesaling specific and this guy came from outside the industry correct mm -hmm. so I, I i'm just curious you know if i was in your acquisition team and you got you brought in someone outside yeah to manage me i might be like dude like you just totally looked right past me yeah and went outside yeah did you guys have that challenge? We, we've we, had that we challenge. We're going through it right now. <laughs> so let's talk yeah. about it. What's going so, on? So the, the reason why we brought them on is because, um, and, and the reason why they're training right now as an acquisition manager, right? So right now their goal is to hit the same numbers that mm -hmm. our acquisition managers are expected to hit. So he's not doing any sales manager responsibilities at the moment. Okay, um, so he's brought in to be the sales manager, but before he can officially take that helm, He's got to prove himself. Correct. 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 Gotcha. And we do that partly because we feel like he needs to get acclimated, mm -hmm. but because we want the other guys to have that sense of respect that we already feel is there on our minds, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but this exactly what you're saying, you know, like, dude, I've been here for six months, you know, a year. Yeah. And you know why why am i not becoming sales yeah. manager so what was the answer to that question yeah. when they asked you that the, the the answer is you know it's it's just because you're good at, at closing deals doesn't mean you're good at getting other people to close deals mm -hmm. right 
Yeah. And so we wanted to bring on somebody who has experienced coaching other sales people mm -hmm. to reach their goals, right? So this uh, sales manager has been <coughs> in uh, City Citibank, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that kind of sold me on him was he was responsible for coaching the um, the retention sales uh, callers. The bottom twenty percent, the people that were in twenty or below, it was his job to coach them to get them up on their numbers. Gotcha. So the um, other eighty percent. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And so we wanted to bring on somebody who, because we we've tried it in the past, having somebody who's in the industry, mm -hmm. right? But they didn't have that managing experience. Gotcha. And it's it's tough to when you're in that group. We all, you know, I'm, I'm saying we like, I'm one of the acquisitionists, right? Mm -hmm. We all kind of started together. We're all in this together. And now I'm responsible for bitching you out. I don't know if we're allowed to cuss or not, <laughs> but, um, you know, telling you you're slacking, mm -hmm. right? And you're my boy. Yeah. We've been, you know, chit-chatting, talking crap about the job, whatever. And now I'm responsible for your numbers. Yeah. Um, so there was a challenge with that. Sure, right. and that makes total sense. Like uh, that's one one thing we see a lot. Um, we saw that in engineering, and we see it in sales. Is like you take a, you know someone's a good engineer, and you promote them to manager. Well, they were never a good manager, so now they're just a crappy manager, and 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 you can't even use their engineering skills anymore. Exactly. And, and the same thing with sales. Like you take a sales guy and you put him as a manager. Okay, now he's a crappy manager, and now you're not getting sales output from him either. Exactly. So exactly. you guys already went through that hurdle once before. Yep. yep. Awesome. And so we're we're seeing that the way to go it's it might not be the best way but it is the way that we're taking is bringing mm -hmm. somebody who has crap ton of managing experience yeah, yeah and, no, it makes total sense um, acclimating them to real estate wholesale yeah. and that's why right now they're just on the phones negotiating you know hitting the trenches just like everybody on the sales floor gotcha. um, and we think it's working well because everybody's excited when he's closing deals now you know he's got his properties under contract um, and so everybody's kind of excited for him mm -hmm. and everybody once broken down why he has the role understands why he has the role gotcha um, and and we've kind of painted it in a picture where if we all want to see the business get to where we're pitching you guys on where we want it to be it's going to be with getting out of our comfort zone and having people pull us up um, and so the only way to do that is by bringing in individuals who right. have the skills that we don't want to take the time to learn. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That yeah. makes total sense. So one of the biggest challenges we see consistently in our industry is finding and keeping the acquisition guy. So you went from three to four and a lot since, you know, well, I didn't meet you, but since you guys were out here last, right? Is it the same three or did you replace some of that three? Different. Different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about that. How are you finding them? and then how you're retaining them. So let's start with finding them. How are you guys finding these guys right now? So it, I think in most cases, it's uh, relationships. It's through people we know. Um, it's through networking. It's through groups. Um, a couple, it's, the funny thing is two of our top sales guys, mm -hmm. um, we, do, we don't do any coaching or anything anything paid right now. Um, we do a show you know, every week um, where we just wanna stay relative to the community and talk about wholesaling because we like it and it's fun. Um, but prior to this, you know, over a year ago, we had a coaching group that we did for close to about a year. Yep. Um, and then someone in that coaching group was just very fond of wholesaling, um, just always wanted to be in real estate, be a part of a team or whatever. And that individual, he's our top, uh, within the last couple of months, he's been our top acquisition manager. Um, he came and he joined the team. Um, and then another individual that started a wholesaling company didn't really get it off on the right foot. Um, but however, you know, from there he went off on his own sales journey into other sales um, uh, positions and other companies, um, learned about our position and came and worked for us just because he was just very fond of real estate and right. wholesaling and wanted to be a part of, um, you know, a group that's, you know, expanding. Um, so those are our kind of our two top sales guys. And then the other individuals are people that know those guys, right? Mm -hmm. So we've done, we've, and then we do a lot of just organic um, 
interviewing and you know home base and and monster and, and zip recruit and all that stuff but it just seems that the people that are truly have their hearts in real estate specifically in wholesaling um, we've done better with recruiting those sorry about that we've done better with recruiting people um, that want to be a part of it truly a part of it rather than people that have sales experience but don't really know what real estate is you right. know they, I think they really like the idea of um, growing with a company and building something and being a part of real estate because real estate's really attractive. So they already knew you or knew about you guys correct? before they right. even applied? In most right. cases, yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And one and, guy brought his brother, mm. right? So now his brother's an acquisition manager. He's doing awesome. And then part of the challenge is figuring something out for the acquisition managers because they might feel like there's a, you know, you, you get every single day you're getting no's you're getting you're getting strung along um, deals fall through um, so you're getting beat up every single day mm -hmm. right as an acquisition manager obviously there's wins but most of the time you're just getting beat up right and so it's figuring out and painting the bigger picture on what can be next yeah. right um, so for one of the guys like we had to figure out they became our field manager right going out to the properties he used to be an acquisition manager now he's a field manager Right, because he was getting to that point where, like, all right, I've been closing for a year, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like I'm good at it, but I want to grow with the company. I want to do more. How do I, um, how can I add value to you guys while still being a part of your group? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the, we had to kind of rearrange the position, and now he's a, he's a field closer. So he goes out to the properties, takes the pictures, does the inspections, gets the contract signed in person. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also figuring stuff out when they're getting to that kind of cap of, hey, I'm thinking I'm getting tired of this job. Getting a little burnt out. I'm getting a little burnt out. You know, what, what is next for me or am I just going to quit? What's you know? interesting about what he's saying is that, you know, in some cases, these people have the essence of visionaries, right? Like they want to grow in whatever position they are whether whether they want to start something on their own but if they decided to work for us now they're working for us they've been with us for a year or so they want to continue to grow and uh you talked about a little bit when you're talking about um the the sales manager position mm -hmm. they didn't get that why didn't they get that why aren't they growing in those you know in that aspect of it uh so they do want to grow and we do continue to have to talk to them and and instill faith in our process and where we're going and part of what we have to tell them like is listen, this is not the only sales manager position that there's going to be. Mm -hmm. Like we want to build squadrons and we want to go into more markets and we want to grow this into being something terrific and great. Um, so just because we implemented one leadership position doesn't mean it's going to be the last leadership position. You know, everyone's right. got to have patience, including us, because we've been eating shit for the last three years. And just because we're having great months right now doesn't mean we're not reinvesting. We're not investing into leadership roles, mm -hmm. marketing, new ideas, technology, new systems, things like that. Like, you know. Wholesaling, people get into wholesaling because they want to build cash flow. They want money now, right? right? But if you're building it like a true business, you're investing real money into this stuff. It's not cheap. No, it's not cheap at all. And I think that's um, it's a very solid point as far as the guys that are in this role tend to be entrepreneurial in nature. Yes. And that's been one of the biggest problems is, um, you know, I know for me in many, many years is uh, even on the traditional real estate side is you train somebody, you bring someone in. And you and you coach them up, and they're successful. Mm -hmm. And now they're like, okay, thanks for everything. <laughs> yeah. And then they go to compete against you. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like you can't, right. you can't, you know, like uh, clip someone's wing and say you can't grow. Correct. But that's just the natural path right. of, of a salesperson when they come in. And so, uh, in fact, uh, you guys met Max last time. Yeah. He was my inside sales agent okay. before he left and came back to to partner. Oh, that's mm. awesome. So, and that's just something that happens all the time. Uh, so. Well, the cool thing about what you're saying, just I, I don't I want to interject really quickly because um, uh, I don't know if you've ever read a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. Of course, yeah. So I'm reading it for the fourth time now. It's an amazing book. I just reread books that I'm yeah, very yeah. fond of pretty pretty frequently, 
and uh, they talk about like if you're going to train strong people in your company mm -hmm. then you have to train them up and be ready for them to move on like you right. just have to expect for them to move on like they're either going to grow with you or they're going to reach their ceiling mm -hmm. and you have to be okay with them going elsewhere yeah. at some point in time yeah and that's to. some of the conversations we've had with people on our team like listen if we can't build new positions quick enough for you to grow with us we're totally okay just be straight up with us talk to us let's just exit strategy be comfortable for everyone um or stick around and let's just work it out to to get you to where you need to be yeah and i'm sure we're getting some questions here about how are you guys compensating uh your acquisition guys because you know there's all sorts of different compensation models yeah we have a sick a sick plan um, we don't compensate them that's why they're <laughs> leaving no <I'm> <laughs> yeah no so, so so we give a base yep base we, we give a base and then we also give a bonus mm -hmm. right um so the basis is, is so we have a range that's in our minds it's roughly between twenty four and thirty six thousand a year base salary, right? And then the bonus is between five and seven percent. We have it tiered mm -hmm. based on how well they do on the front end negotiation, right? So if they do really well, they can get as good as a seven percent uh, bonus by the time it closes. Um, and if they do just um, very close to the maximum we're about to pay, and we do get to close it, um, that'll be closer to five percent. Of, gotcha. of a bonus gotcha. right so they're making between 60 70 thousand a year um you know and if they're uh, not hitting 60 it's just very close to the 60. Gotcha. um yeah and one thing that I, I heard you mention in reinvesting back in the business you mentioned leadership which is a, a topic i'm very passionate about mm -hmm. so what kind of leadership are you guys investing into okay like what programs or what are you guys looking into cool so um sales manager is one of the first le oh, one of the leadership positions that we have. Mm. We also have an HR manager, accountant, individual. He's kind of an all-encompassing office support person. Um, and then there's G and I, right? Mm. So one of the next things that we're looking at is an operations manager. And the way that we look at sales manager versus operation manager is pre-acquisition contract and post-acquisition contract, mm -hmm. right? Um, we just had we've had long discussions and it's kind of the way that we operate right there's a, like a clear divide of what happens before the acquisition contract and what happens after the con uh, the acquisition contract mm -hmm. what we try to do in our company is we try to as soon as the deal is is locked up and closed and it's not perfect but as soon as it's locked up and closed with the acquisitionist we try to take it off their plate so they can just deal with nothing with sales and new acquisitions mm -hmm. right. right so we have an acquisition support person we call it a liaison um, and then G is really kind of like an operations manager um, to where he helps with taking that off of their place and really just pushing it over to the disposition side of the company, right? So we have the sales manager for the acquisitionists and one of the next leadership roles is probably going to be operations manager, which is going to kind of be a sales manager for the disposition side of the business. Yeah. Gotcha. If that makes sense. So, you know, for people that are watching this show, you got, you know, both of you guys, who wears what hats? What are you guys responsible for? Gotcha. So, so I'm the CEO and G's the president. Mm -hmm. G does a lot more of the operational side of the business, which G, is G2020. G2020, <laughs> Gonzalo. <laughs> so he does a lot of the moving parts of both sales manager and operations manager. Mm -hmm. And um, and I support backup for G as well as project management. Um, and we work together on big decisions for the company. Yeah. So he's handling operations and sales. Yep. You're managing. Uh, he, uh, don't get me in trouble, G, uh, <laughs> Steve. I don't do anything. He, no, no. He, you boss yeah. G around. So, so <laughs> when when it comes to negotiating the deals and mm -hmm. locking the deals up under contract, working with the sales guys, yeah. that's what I do. Mm -hmm. So Dom works with the marketing side and our company automations. Mm -hmm. We call him a project manager. Yeah. In the world of real estate, people think of that as like a construction manager who goes mm -hmm. to the projects. Yeah. We don't do that. Um, but the project manager just works on Podio, create pulling lists, skip tracing, um, creating different automations in the system, different workflows. And I know I might be getting a little technical, but uh, That's fine. with Podio and, and um, different integrations with Zapier, and Globy Flow, um, automating the system basically. Yeah. So yeah. Dom takes care of that end, takes care of hiring the virtual assistants, pulling lists, 
uh, make sure we have a consistent lead flow, right? And then Dom also handles a bunch of the employee stuff, mm-hmm. right? Um, hiring. Hiring, getting the employees in trouble, <laughs> right? Correcting yeah. them. Um, Documenting so it's like, the write-ups. Yeah, good cop, bad cop, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of backup for G because like on the sales side of it, like it can become pretty overwhelming, especially like we're aspiring to scale. We're doing a lot of transactions. Uh, I think we did 21 last month, but 21 means that you might've started with trying to do 30 to 35, 35 to 38 or whatever, right. and not all of them work out, right? So there's just a lot of moving parts and a lot of activity, right? So he'll be over helping someone, someone else needs assistance, and I'm back up for that as yeah. well. Gotcha. Okay, so the other thing you mentioned was that you are you went from one disposition to two disposition people. Yeah. How has that helped you? So that has helped us tremendously, especially during the COVID outbreak, mm-hmm. right? Because a lot of our, our biggest issue during COVID was the buyers, right? Buyers stopped buying. Um, buyers were backing out. Buyers yep. were lowering the amount that they were offering. Mm. Um, buyers are no longer buying tenant occupied properties. You know, a flipper in the past would, he'd buy it, kick the tenant out, you mm-hmm. know, whatever. Now they're like, all right, it has to be vacant. I can't evict. I don't know how long it's going to be until I can't evict or whatever. Yep. Um, so it's been a struggle trying to, or at least it was, right, trying to position deals to investors. And we had a ton of buyers, but you get comfy working with the ones that you know. Mm-hmm. You know, this guy's going to buy it. You know, let's send it to him. Um, and so now when that, the usual buyers, you know, they're maybe paid, they would have maybe paid 100 grand for this deal three months ago. Now they're offering me 85. Yeah. You know, it, it takes a while before our acquisition adjustments kicked in to, you know, because we lowered the amount that we were locking deals up under contract, but that takes a while to kick in. You still mm-hmm. have these 20 properties that you have under contract. What are we going to do? Yep. Um, and so it's it's worked awesome being able to be more proactive with dispositions, right? Before we were a little more mainly reactive, right? Because it was only one person. It's my wife. Mm-hmm. So she was... Couldn't yell at her. Yeah, can't yell at her. <laughs> and so she will, she's been with us since day one as dispositions, right? And she did disposition and transaction coordination. And then we have, you know, now we have a transaction coordinator um, and she's awesome. So she's allowed my wife to focus specifically on dispositions. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're trying to scale and grow, obviously you get overwhelmed every single day. Right. Uh, because now, you know, you get a new deal. Um, and in fact, like, they just messaged us um, yesterday or last week. We had 11, 12 properties under contract with this, uh, disposition, right? Yeah, yeah. Within yeah. a week span, it was like 10 locked up on the yeah. disposition side, uh, or 11, uh, 10 within like three a three day span. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So in the last Which three days, awesome. we sent so those are going 10 new escrow. properties to title. So we disposition person. They're in charge of obviously moving the properties. Are they yeah. also in charge of prospecting for buyers? They are in charge of. Mm, not, not really. Not really. Okay, no. so who's doing that? So we, we're we taking more of a reactive approach to prospecting for buyers. Mm-hmm. So we get a lot of influx. So wh- whenever we get a deal under contract, we put it out everywhere, mm-hmm. right? Social media. Um, Tons of different websites, connected investors, yeah. bigger pockets. We cast a really big web. So it drives um, a lot of people to opt into our list, right? So we're yeah. getting what, two or three a day, yeah. two or three a day new buyers. So we have thousands of buyers on our buyers list in our market, and we're getting two or three every single day um, that are opting into our list. And that doesn't include the people that see our deals, that just call in, that negotiate or whatever, you know, and then they continue to, to inquire and call and potentially, you know, buy mm-hmm. uh, that haven't opted in as well. Gotcha. Yeah. And how are you guys finding your disposition person? Disposition person was another person that wanted to be in, in wholesaling, yeah. and um, it's funny because yeah, the way. W- when we when we were doing our, or when we were having our coaching, mm-hmm. you know, we we did free office visits, so that we'd allow people to come into our office for free for like a quick little twenty minute tour. We'd give them a little tour, and then we try to, you know, sell them. Hey, if you want to learn more, 
come to our event or whatever, right? right. Um, and this was actually one of the persons that came in to do the tour. And um, they had came to do the tour probably a year before we hired them. Yeah. Um, and then one thing I, I actually didn't remember is at the time, his name is Charles, by the way, shout out to Charles. Um, when he did the tour, I didn't remember this, and he told us this later after he hired us. He said, I told you, man, what happens, because he lived in Tennessee, he was like, hey, man, he goes, I'll just quit my job, I'll move to Jacksonville, I'll work for you guys right now, you know, would you guys take us on? And we weren't ready to take, we weren't hiring at that point. Yeah. yeah. But it was flattering, you know? Right. Um, and it just so happens that X amount of months later, yeah. you know, uh, we're hiring for a disposition agent, and he had already lived in Jacksonville, I guess he knew, his, uh, you know, his wife had family out here in Jacksonville, yeah. you know, in yeah. Jacksonville and stuff like that, so. Um, they moved to Jacksonville. We were hiring, and he saw the post, so he came in for an interview. That's yep. awesome. Yep. Yeah. So uh, another question these guys must be asking is what w – um, to get to 200, you know, well, A, I appreciated that you guys sent the uh, the HUD in a well-packaged. Oh, did it come through good in, in for a, in, you? In a good um, Google Drive where I can just click through the HUD, so I really appreciate that. Normally oh. I just get an email, and I have to kind of like figure it all out. <laughs> so I appreciated that. Okay. Um, what uh, what lead source has been most effective for you guys in in Jacksonville? Mm, secrets. You guys are getting the secrets now. <laughs> we so, charge uh, for this, bro. So, so cold calling yeah. is is just the so one calling. of the major lead sources yeah. for us. Yeah, cold calling. We're we're heavy on cold calling. You know. Yeah. Uh, we've got about eleven agents. Um, one of the things that we're looking at doing now is just picking up another four or five agents, mm -hmm. um, because now that we're going into another market and we're starting to see success. Um, and a clear path of how to succeed in that second market. Um, now, since we're and then we're st we we still see a lot of potential on on doing more in the market that we're in. By the way, yeah. like we're not done with expanding inside of our market. There's a lot of things that we're going to just zero in on. Uh, but at the same time, we can expand as well. So um, when we go into the other market, and uh, we we've only pulled a small amount of data. There's so much more data that we can pull into that in that market, so that we can start doing more sales. Um, we're going to be able to expand now. We're going to be able to hire on more sales people and build on the team. Where are you guys finding these agents? Cold calling. Mm -hmm. Dang, they want all the secrets. You know, yeah. um, it's a, it's it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So basically, we we do it organically. We mess around with Upwork here and there. We hadn't really had a ton of success with it, but really, we've had more success on Craigslist, right? But not only just Craigslist, it's it's Craigslist in the countries that we target. And we mainly have been targeting like Central and South American countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had a good experience. A lot of the people um, that live in Central and South America, um, they spend a good part of their lives in the US. Yeah. You know, it's either they came over as, as kids, you know, mm -hmm. after they were born, they weren't quite legal. They spent, you know, their grammar school, time middle school time in in the u.s and just moved back and whatever the case may be however it worked out i, I feel like half of our of our agents mm -hmm. have lived in the u.s for a good period of time and the other ones that haven't they just they they get our culture um they can talk you know it's not just that they've learned english so they know how to speak it it's they get how to have a conversation with an american yeah um and that just seems to make a big difference for us because we've had philippine agents and uh, agents from India and things like that and we've had bad experiences and um, and then you know maybe it was early on in our wholesale career maybe it's not because those countries don't work um, it just that's the path that led us to getting to the agents that we pick right now mm -hmm. um, and then now since uh, we're trying to aggressively add agents on another four or five you know within the next few weeks hopefully um, we are we are gonna uh, put ads out into yeah you know, Philippines and India, Pakistan, things like that, just to see if there's still hope for, for that size, just so we have, you know, an abundance of options. Um, but we'll just have to see how that turns out. Yeah. I mean, I've kind of heard the same thing. Just it's hard in the Philippines <clears throat> to have that same track record, same consistent success. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing people are like, from what appears, Costa Rica seems to be like the most popular as far as finding, you know, expats. Um, right. What mm -hmm. are you guys paying these people? Uh, the cold callers? Mm -hmm. So we're paying them anywhere between four to seven dollars an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on number one, obviously their skill set and their background, but also what they're used to getting paid. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
after a year, like, because we have some people that have been with us, some cold callers that have been with us for over a year. Yeah. Um, so we've bumped them up on their on their wages, and they also and get responsibilities, and they also get um, bonus. Um, so depending on the amount of leads that they get after every um, every month, they have different tiers. So if they get X amount of leads, they qualify for first level incentive. And if they gotcha. get more more leads, then they get a second tier incentive. Um, and so that's kind of how we're paying them anywhere between four to seven. And who's managing them? So we have one uh, manager in the office and she manages them all day. Gotcha. So she trains them up, she listens to their calls, she answers their questions, she makes sure the leads come in and tasks out mm-hmm. the leads to the acquisition managers. Um, yeah, so that's that's o- only her role. Yeah, actually. at one point in the beginning, she was an in-house cold caller herself uh, for for a long for a long time. Yeah. So another right. one of the leadership positions. Another one of the leadership positions. Yep. Yeah. So she's kind of like, and we we entitle the the VAs lead specialists. So she's like the manager for the lead specialists. Yeah. Um, and on the same token, she's a lead manager in the sense as well. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one thing, uh, this is just as an aside because I had a debate with somebody last week. Mm. Um, Florida. I've heard that you will get crushed if you do RVMs and texts just from a TCPA that they're state specific laws. I've heard that. I haven't mm-hmm. investigated it. What are your, what is your guys's uh, experience? So I'm going to have to talk to my attorney uh, before I answer that. No, I'm, I'm not asking what you guys think. I'm just asking what are you guys hearing out there? Yeah, so Florida is definitely one of those states that everybody's cautious in mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. with text, RVM. Um, we kind of just do what we do mm-hmm. and try to follow it as best as possible. Yeah, uh, follow the the rules as best as possible. But is it um, is it a, is it additional laws in Florida or the Attorney General just more proactive? Um, I think it's additional laws. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, but there, I don't there, I I don't take my advice for this. You know. Um, not an attorney. I'm not an attorney. You know, yeah. but. Um, from what we know, it seems that there's different laws in Florida rather than more enforced. But what's yeah. cool to see yeah. is there's software out there that works in a way to compensate for the laws, right? And they claim to be, you know, safe to use in, in any state in the U.S., right? So they'll function like if there's texting software, they'll function in a way as if you're sending the text individually. Mm-hmm. Um, and they actually make you kind of do it individually, but you, they help you to do it faster. Mm-hmm. And we're using, we're using software like that. Gotcha. Right? So if we're going to text, then we're going to do it legitimately that c- complies with the, TCPA. What is it, the TCPA laws. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're doing stuff like that. Um, we're not doing a whole ton of RVM stuff. like It's more like you know, cold calling and texting. And, and a lot of the texting that we do, it's really on, on the buyer side. So we're, we're just getting information quicker to the people that expect to hear from us. Yeah, yeah we don't really do text blasting gotcha. um, for sellers. We, we use um, call tools mm-hmm. is the dialer that we use. And it sends out texts um, as it dials. So instead of sending out, you know, 30,000 texts, We'll call the list, and if they don't pick up, then they get a text message. Or if they hang up on Got us, it. then they'll get a text message. Got it. Um, so that's kind of how we've been doing it. Very cool. Um, you guys don't seem to be have been impacted by COVID. Uh, a we little were. bit, yeah. a little bit, man. Yeah. So, so the 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 funny thing is, we've we've been having a gradual growth for the last couple of couple of years. You know, we've been tweaking little things, adding to the process, getting better as we go along. And, um, you know, we had a record breaking month in March. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we just we just had momentum. We had the momentum. We were feeling good. We were growing. And then COVID came in and, um, you know, everyone was getting nervous. And then it just started seem it seemed like like, you know, sellers on the seller side and investors on on the buyer side, like no one knew what to expect. Right. Right. And since they didn't know what to expect, they didn't do anything. You know, it's not like they didn't want to sell or buy. They didn't want to buy. They wanted to, but they just didn't know what was going to happen. So they wanted to stand on the sidelines to wait and see what was going to happen, right? So I don't know. I think we had like one hundred seventy, hundred eighty thousand dollar month in in March, um, and then we still had a good month in April. It was, it was over a hundred thousand dollars, 
and then uh, May started to kind of tank a little. It was more between fifty and sixty thousand dollars. So um, during that time frame, we started questioning, like, you know, is it us in a way? Like, I know mm -hmm. there's a problem, but sometimes you don't want to believe there's a problem. Like, you know, your process has worked, and you want to push forward, and you still want to drive, and you don't really want to change anything. But then life teaches you a lesson. And it tells you to be creative and figure yeah. new things out. Now, in, in a way, it was a blessing in disguise because it made us implement processes that help us to operate more efficiently now that the, you know, the economy is recovering a little bit and we're able to, you know, you know, people are coming to terms with the fact that COVID's here, but, you know, life goes on. You still have yeah. to work with it. You still have to push forward and buy and sell. What did you whatever. guys tweak? So one of the big things was, um, was the texting on the buyer side, right? Getting information to more buyers quicker right portraying your deals over to a bigger array of people to get more interest on them yeah right so that that was like probably the biggest learning experience yeah. Yeah. i would say um before that and it um, sounds so common sense you know just like yeah. text your buyers <laughs> but we've built a good reputation in jacksonville mm -hmm. um, and we have a good group of buyers and because of the network of buyers that we've built, we have a lot of repeat customers. Mm -hmm. um, and and the repeat customers that we have mm -hmm. are, they're paying good prices for the deals. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it's worth it for us to, you know, cause sometimes you get those repeat customers that are like, oh, you know, you, you used to make five grand on my deals. Now you're making 15 grand on my deals. What's going on, mm -hmm. you know? And we have some repeat customers that are like, dude, you're gonna make 10 grand or you're gonna make 50 grand. As long as it fits my number, I'll buy it, you know? Right. And that's kind of the, the relationships that we have out there. And so you get kind of comfy just, you know, calling five guys, mm -hmm. easy sale. Right. Um, and then COVID hits, those five guys drop their numbers, you know, or are out of it for the next month because they want to see what's going to happen. So now it's, all right, we've had this list of buyers for years. We haven't, you know, we email blast them, but email blast, you know, you can email blast 4,000 emails. Yeah. You only get 200 opens. So there's, you know, 3,800 people that didn't see the deal. Um, so how do we get to them? Right. You know, and, and text blasting has been, a, has been huge for us. Um, and then it's also lowering the acquisition number, right? So lowering the amount of, uh, the, the amount that we're offering to sellers um, because that obviously buyers are offering less um but that's always been a struggle for us not not just but more of a mental struggle you know it's the the whole struggle of like i could make five on it so let's lock it up instead of all right i need to make 10 on this one mm -hmm. you know i need to make 15 grand on it yeah. so that's been a, a a mindset shift for us is offering less and getting better deals what um, is you guys' targeted fee we target to make 15. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. what are you guys finding to be your average fee? Our average fee has been about 10 to 13. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, before we even jumped on the air, we were talking about business building. Um, that, that was one of the things you guys are going to be focusing on as well. What does that mean exactly? So what we want to do is um, our dream, right, is to build squadrons, right? And a squadron would consist of the exact amount of people that could um, handle leads from a specific market size or combination of, of market sizes um, that can flow equally throughout the, the people in the squadron. So when you look at our team, it's, it's like an assembly line, right? We have project management and lead generation, right? So they're generating, you know, they're, they're putting together the, the lead source and they skip trace it, they load the dialers, they handle the virtual assistants. Um, and they're bringing the leads in, right? When the leads come in, they they disqualify the ones that we know and there's signs that we look at that we know we're not gonna get a deal with or most likely we're not gonna get a deal with this individual. The remaining leads, they hand over to the acquisition managers. Mm -hmm. And the acquisition managers, you know, they have their follow-up schedules and their routines and their rules that they have to go by with handling the scripts and the conversations and the offers and the contracts and things of that sort. 
So they're gonna lock up those deals. Once they lock up those deals with the sellers, they pass them on to the acquisition liaison, which in a sense is really like kind of an acquisition assistant or support person for the acquisition managers. Um, and that person is gonna handle um, like for us, we pull the deeds, we get a lot of information, we call the sellers up, we get all the lease information, is the tenant month to month or when does the lease end, all of that information. And they're in charge of setting the initial appointment and the initial walkthrough. Um, and then they're also a support person for dispositions for um, setting showing appointments for that property for our investors, right? Gotcha. So that individual handles that. From that person, it goes on to a disposition liaison, which in a sense is a support person or an assistant for the disposition side of the business. And they're gonna do a lot of the buyer marketing and the email blasts mm -hmm. and posting our deals on all different websites and um, things of that sort, Support other support things that we have in line for the disposition managers. And once all that's done, um, then a lot of interest comes to the disposition managers by way of email, phone calls into the office and things of that sort. And then the disposition managers also will uh, mass uh, text blast targeted investors for the properties depending on the category the property falls into, you know, buy and hold or flips, things of that sort. Um, and then once they contract the deals with the investors, then all of that information, you know, all the paperwork from the, the the acquisition side and the disposition side goes to the transaction coordinator and then they take it from there and try to take all the burden away from all sides of the business and handle it from that point going forward until we close right so what is that what are the right numbers what's the right number of acquisition uh, managers versus the right number of disposition managers acquisition liaison disposition liaison the right number of VAs how many leads need to come in that a VA can handle, and then how many VAs transitions to an acquisition manager, and so on and so forth down the assembly line. So we're getting close, and we're not perfect, yeah. but we feel like we have the numbers pretty close. And then once <coughs> that is, you know, as close as possible, mm -hmm. um, as we're going into our next market, we're starting to see kind of a morph of a second squadron being built inside of the first squadron. So what that's gonna create is, you know, adding more sales managers, adding more dispositions, adding more support people, and then ultimately separating the teams, right? Oh. So, you know, team one might handle, you know, all of Jacksonville and half of San Antonio, and then team two is gonna handle half of San Antonio and then we're gonna come into Arizona. You know, we're Good gonna luck. kick you guys out of Arizona. Good <laughs> no, luck. No, probably <laughs> not, probably not. But you get where I'm going with mm -hmm. it, you know, and then they'll handle a certain, you know, it's really all in the number of, of leads that we can pull in from, you know, the, the markets that we're in to, I to can support see why, that team. I can see why Dominic's in charge of the the project management and, yes. and the whole organization. I'm just a wholesaler, <laughs> man. <laughs> That's awesome, that was really cool. All right, so let's get to some of these questions. Um, these guys have been awfully patient with us. Uh, so you got some love over here from Leo. Uh, let's see. Awesome, uh, Leo. Why would you really do so early? What's the return to keep these guys? Uh, so what is the most challenging thing for you in this business? So I think one of the most, like what's be, gonna become, and, and we're starting to see that, the most challenging thing is to build leadership roles, mm -hmm. right? To choose the right people for the leadership roles um, you know, we don't really know. We have experience um, hiring and training people that can work for us as leaders, um, but to hire people that can lead the other individuals is going to be a really challenging thing. Um, we don't have a whole lot of experience in that. I had another business before this. Um, it wasn't a big thing that I've worked toward. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was always the leader, um, but now that you know, you've been in business for a long time and then, you know, we're, we're in personal development and, you know, we want to grow something great. It's going to be, you know, true leaders build leaders, right? Absolutely. That's no, going to be one of our main You can't build a great challenges. organization without building leaders. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you touched on earlier uh, was coaching where you guys said you were trying to coach for a little bit, but you guys don't do that anymore. Correct. Talk about that because a lot mm. of people, yeah. uh, you see it, you know, anyone, someone has a little bit of success, like I'm a coach now. Yeah, and they kind of like transition away or whatever. Right. right. So talk about uh, what um, tempted you to do it, mm -hmm. and it was what caused you to say, "Ah, forget it." Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. So a lot of it kind of got started because we were getting asked mm -hmm. a lot um, locally in Jacksonville. I 
um, we're very involved in the community, mm -hmm. right? So we try to go to as many networking events as possible. Um, any opportunity that there is to teach a class, we'll teach it. Um, I, I was vice president of the local uh, RIA. Oh, really? So I was on the board for two years. Then I was VP for one year. So our name is out there in in the local market. And then there's, you know, every single three months, a new networking event pops up, right? And so we're big on, um, because one of the reasons why we're so active on networking and stuff like that is for recruiting, mm -hmm. right? Like most of our it people sounds have come, like it's been very effective. Yeah. Most of the people that, that come work for us, they, they know about us, they know about our business before they even come work for us. Yeah. And so um, because of that, we were out there and we started getting a lot of people asking us questions. Hey, how do you do this? You know, can I can I uh, spend a day at your office? Is kind of how it started. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked to spend a day at our office and we charged them for it. And what we did is we let them sit with each department, right? So they would sit with the um, manager who manages the, uh, the virtual assistants. So they sat with them for an hour, right? Yeah. And they watched all that. And then they sat with an acquisition manager and they watched them. Then they sat with um, the uh, acquisition liaison, watched what they did, then sat with the disposition liaison and transaction coordination. And it was cool because we were, we were able to bring these people in we sat with them for about half hour in the morning, kind of, you know, teeing them up on how the day was going to go. Yeah. And then the team would kind of handle the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it seemed kind of lucrative for us, right? Because we're like, hey, one person, you know, they'll pay us a thousand bucks to hang out with us for one day. Um, and not a lot of people were bringing people into their office. A lot of people do trainings, but they don't bring them into their office right, right. or the, there's a lot of coaches out there but they're not really doing it mm -hmm. right and so there's a handful of people out there that are crushing it still have massive operations and are coaching as well um, but most of the coaches out there had their success and are now just focused on coaching mm -hmm. right and so we saw that there was a little niche in the coaching industry of, of wholesaling where there's not a lot of people out there saying come to my office shadow my team you know, mm -hmm. um, so we felt like we could be effective with that. And so it started off with one person and then we're like, hey, let's start promoting it online. You know, or social media. Hey, this guy's at our office for the day. If you guys are interested, you know, hit me up. And then people were contacting us um, and that led to another thing. And then out of nowhere, we were doing, you know, events um, at our office with four or five people shadowing one department. Yeah. And then uh, we conference took the room. conference room table out and had 16, 16 people, people in there. Um, and then instead of them shadowing at their desk, we'd have the we put uh, a workstation in our yeah. conference room. So yeah. we'd bring the workstation monitor there to in front of the people. Yep. That's yeah. awesome. And then we were like, shit, let's rent out a hotel room, you know, because this thing is working. Mm -hmm. um, and then we recreated that whole event in a hotel room. We had 80 people there. Um, and then we were going down the path of, all right, let's start a mastermind group, you know, because people will pay more for that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a desire for it. There's a need for it. And we're big believers, you know, every year we join a different mastermind group. So we're big believers in it. We do it ourselves. Um, but, and it's funny because we're growing in our office, right? And where we're at in our office right now, we had to tear down walls. We had to kick our landlord out of part of the building um, so that we could take over some space. Mm -hmm. And in the past, we didn't have all the space that we have now in our office. So Dom and I... Um, it's funny, but Dom and I used to have like very serious conversations in like our storage room closet because that was the only place we could go where it was super quiet. Come out smelling like mop water. Right? You know? So we're like, bro, you got two minutes? And then we'd go hide in the, in the closet really quick and just talk. And I remember just sitting there and we were both talking. We were like, dude, should we like we, we started a mastermind group. We had four people signed up. They had already gave us five grand each to do this three month mastermind group. And um, we were coming back from a momentum event and we were super pumped because mm -hmm. we were like, shit, there's so much stuff that we can still do in our, in our business, you know? And we sat down and we were like, what if all the time that we had put into this coaching, we had 
put into our wholesale business? You know, like where would we be? Mm-hmm. And we feel like we're behind in our wholesale business on where it could be because for a year we were focused on coaching and it almost felt like we were cheating on our wholesale business, mm-hmm. you know, and our staff because our staff, they're, they thrive off of closing deals, you know, and we pitch them on, we're going to become the biggest and the baddest wholesale company in the nation. And that was no longer our focus. It was, but it was, you know, doing two things. It was like know? said, but not being done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we were sitting in the, in the storage closet and we just made the decision. We're like, all right, let's like, should we really do this? You know, like we're about, because once you take five grand from people and, and we're, we're very, very honest people. So we want to commit, we're going to go out of our way, especially getting started in coaching. Mm-hmm. We totally undercharged for everything that we do in, that we did in coaching because we were trying to build our brand, get clients, whatever. Right. And we knew that once we commit to coaching somebody, like we're going to do everything that we can to make sure they're successful. Right. And we just knew that starting a mastermind group and going down that path is going to ultimately take all of our time away from our wholesale business. Mm -hmm. And we thought our wholesale business was there to be self sufficient, but it it was nowhere close to what we wanted it to be. And it's nowhere close now. Right. And so, we just made that decision right there and then we're like all right screw it we called up the people sorry to tell you this but we're just too busy to do this we're going to give you back your money if something comes back up you'll be the first person we reach out to and we still have great relationships with those people um and we've introduced them to other mentors and our mentors you know like hey i can't mentor you but these are the people that are mentoring us you know go with them um but that's kind of how it happened and we just saw all the numbers that we were doing we're like all right we just spent like four months putting on this event trying to put on this event and we're like all right let's look at the numbers like no money that's a couple there that's a couple wholesale deals you know like let's just put our energy back into our wholesale business and then like two months after we stopped coaching and just went all into wholesaling we hit our first six-figure month um and we just felt the impact of us just 100 percent driven into our wholesale business and we feel right now like we should be more down the line of where we want to be, but we kind of took a little hiatus because of coaching. And I don't regret it because it forced us to put ourselves out there, forced us to brand ourselves on social media, forced us to do Facebook stories every day and, you know, Instagram stories and build that following, which is still important to our wholesale business right now, whether it's buyers, or credibility for other wholesalers that want to JV with us or expanding and and recruiting people that are watching us online. So we're still big believers on branding. That's why we still do like a Tuesday night show and we own a networking group in Jacksonville. Um, so we're big believers of it, but we just don't wanna commit by charging people. Cause once you charge somebody now, like you can't sleep at night unless you're performing for this. Oh, you got it, you got it, you, you got it treat their money right exactly uh claudio has a question is how are you guys staying lean marketing wise but still able to produce plenty of leads for the acquisition team did he say staying lean Mm -hmm. how are you staying lean marketing wise and still able to provide leads Mm -hmm. so i think it's just uh continuously pulling data um and then one thing that we've learned and this is not entirely proven some of it is theoretical is like we'll pull a mass amount of data right and Mm -hmm. we'll pull it quarterly and we'll re-pull a lot of the same data all over quarterly and it'll perform like brand new data. So we're big on cold calling, right? So when we pull a list and we dial a list, it'll perform well, right? And if we dial through that same list, it'll perform less well than it did the first time. And then the third time and the fourth time that you go through that list, you'll get less leads from it over time, right? Mm -hmm. And then if we go back in the beginning of the next quarter and pull that same exact list, it performs brand new again. And my theory is, and I don't know if this is proven, I haven't really dialed it on on this data, but the theory is like, you know, people are moving, there's new people that occupy those properties, they change their phone numbers, there's all these different things that go on in people's lives. You know, you have 18 year olds that bought their first home, 20, you know, people in their early 20s bought their first home, now Mm. they're on the list. You know, things like that are going on all the time. So we're pulling the same data entirely over, um, and then data. We, it just data, and then it just performs like brand new data, gotcha. um, and that's kind of the way that we're working with it now. Cool. Uh, so Jawan says, 
you have to bear with this question. Uh, he's been marketing consistently for six months, but still no deal. And it feels like not enough leads, but he's been marketing to a good amount of people. Mm -hmm. If you were in his position, what would you do? So I, I, I feel like I, I know the answer. Um, but I'm not gonna give it. But I'm not gonna <laughs> say it. Tune in next week, no. Um, it's, and, and maybe this isn't the, the correct answer, but the answer to me is your buyer's list, mm -hmm. right? Because it, I feel like he, uh, Joan might not know what his buyers are looking for or what his buyers are willing to pay for the deals that are out there. Yeah. Um, and so I, every wholesaler that I, that I meet that wants to get started, I always ask him, you're only as good as your buyer's list, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How good is your buyer's list? And a lot of people out there are just like, just find a good deal, you find a good deal, it'll sell, right? But confidence in wholesaling is everything, especially just getting started. Yeah. And the fear of you not making a strong offer to the seller because you don't know if you're gonna perform or not is going to stop you from doing deals. So I, I feel like, and this is what made me a successful wholesaler is, especially when, when we started our business, you know, I had already been wholesaling for a couple of years before I started this business with Dom. So when I started this business with Dom, we had buyers already. So like we did our first deal, you know, within a month or two um, of once we started doing marketing because I had already done a ton of deals and I right. already had buyers. I knew what they were looking for. Um, so if you don't have a solid list of buyers and a good relationship with buyers, not confidence is everything. Mm -hmm. And having the ability to portray that confidence to the seller and being confident in, all right, if I'm gonna offer them 50, I know it's super low, but I'm gonna be able to perform, right? right? And so most of the time you're not making the offers that you should be making because you're either scared that you're not gonna be able to sell it or you're offering too low, right? Mm -hmm. And I know this might sound weird, but there's deals out there that you know you feel like you need it for 30, there's a buyer that's willing to pay 45, you can offer them 40 and make five grand on it, mm -hmm, you right. know? It's um, almost like buyers equals confidence, confidence equals deals. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and you kind of see it in some of these guys, you know, they're, they're offering $100 EMDs, which I'm not saying anything wrong with it, but if you're confident in that number, you feel more confident in yes. your EMD. Yeah, yes. for sure. Uh, yeah. Lucas Orozco wants to know, did you guys decrease your marketing expenses at all? I'm, I'm presuming he's talking about COVID here. Did you guys reduce your marketing during COVID? We, we actually didn't. We yeah. actually didn't. One of the things that we, we sat down and had a conversation with, about was we're going to try to operate as close to normal as we possibly can um, because in our minds, like, it felt temporary, and it kind of still does feel temporary because, um, you know, ultimately, you know, the masks are going to go away. The vaccine is going to be here, and people are going to operate normally. People are going to still, you know, contract the disease and, or the, the – um, whatever the flu, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, but we just we just said to ourselves, we're not gonna panic, we're not gonna retreat, we're gonna continue to market the same, operate the same. We did cut, cut a, a couple of loose ends, we tightened a few things up, we explored new options, but we did not reduce our marketing. Yeah. And then uh, Leo wants to know, are you guys, is there a certain amount of deals you guys need to do per month to break even? Mm. Mm. Certain amount of deals? Mm -hmm. So, with it really comes down to to um profit per deal right mm -hmm. but we we probably need to at least make like 80 grand a month yeah to at least break even yeah yeah to cover yeah. all the marketing I was gonna say and eight overhead. to ten deals and and we're getting eight to 13 a deal yeah. so i mean yeah. the 10 to 13 a deal so yeah cool um and if there's one thing that you guys could change about your business what would you guys change Mm. That's a good question. If there's one thing we can change about our business, what would we change? Uh, sheesh, dude. We've been talking straight. We haven't paused on any questions so far. That's more deep than yeah. people realize. Um, you got something for us, G? If, if I could change something in our business, I would say... It, the, I, I would want to say not start the coaching and just go in on the real estate but without that experience you wouldn't have known like it's always going to sit in the back and it feels like it would ultimately come back one day so be a distraction more so when you're not ready for it and right. now that we've gotten that out of our system um i i guess i guess i would want to know from other parties 
what that experience is like. So I would rather know whether to, to try it or not. Um, and we didn't have any any experience like that. So we basically we tried it on our own. Um, and it kind of put our growth trajectory on hold in a, in a sense. So if I could know that information and not do it, uh, we'd be further along in our real estate business than we are right now. Got it. Uh, if that helps. That yeah. helps a lot. And, and, I, and I would say another thing, I don't know, because <coughs> obviously you, we're here today because of everything that we've done in the past, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't wanna, I don't really have any regrets, but a big mindset shift for us was offering lower, was, was um, negotiating a better deal right and the reason was because we knew it was a quick thing you know mm -hmm. um if, if we can get this deal under contract we can make a quick two grand on it just flipping it to this guy you know let's make a quick two grand on it make right. a quick three grand on it um and that's how it was like the first year like our first year in business like our average profit was like 4300 bucks per yeah. deal right <laughs> and so um because we we want to have that equal balance of decent margins and decent volume Right, because um, right. we also don't want to do four deals at forty grand a deal. You know, um, it's hard to replicate that. It's right? hard to repeat for sure. Yeah, and so that was a big thing for me, right? Because when I was a one man show, like two grand, four grand deal is awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and you know I do one of those a month, two of those a month is great. But now you have a you know you have a team, you have a staff, you have an overhead. I can't really afford those two grand deals anymore, you know, no, because those two grand deals almost take more time than the 15 grand deal. You're losing based on yeah, profit per deal. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So that that's one of the things that I think, uh, and we have this challenge with our acquisition managers, um, especially during COVID, because during COVID we made a drastic, no, I wouldn't say a drastic, but over time we've tweaked it down and down and down a little bit more. Um, and it's funny because we just tell them the numbers to get them under contract mm -hmm. and they just get them under contract. It just happens you know? that way. Yeah. yeah. And so that was one of our biggest things was let's lower it a little bit. And yeah. So that's something that I would say. Uh, Ron wants to know what markets are you guys in? We were talking about Jacksonville. Are you guys in other markets? Are you guys looking at South, uh, South Florida? We're not, we're not looking at South Florida. We've heard some pretty horrible things about South Florida. Uh, Miami's a tough market. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, so basically what we we're in Jacksonville, Florida, and what we uh, what we try to do is we try to look at the other markets and try to figure out which ones are as similar to Jacksonville as possible because that's how where we know how to operate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all the way down to like the the climate, right? You know, and the climate during the winter. Like winter months can be disruptive storms and you know icing and all that stuff. So San Antonio seemed to be very similar in climate, very similar in median price point. In fact, the price point's a little bit lower. Um, one thing that was really interesting is that their their market size was about five times bigger than Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, really? So if we can operate the way that we operate in Jacksonville inside of San Antonio and we have a lot of room for expansion and we can build roots into that market, I think we can go a long way. Gotcha, yeah. very cool. And that answers Jorge's question about what market are you guys going into? There you San go. Antonio. Yep. Arizona. Um, Everyone should go in Arizona. <laughs> Everyone should definitely become in Arizona. A <laughs> lot of us are looking at other markets. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, so you guys had mentioned that you guys are purely focused on uh, on wholesaling. So you guys aren't doing any flipping or any retail at all, like just no. strictly. We're closing on our first wholesale deal. Yeah. In September on September fifteenth. Yeah. So we're buying a condo, Ponte Vedra Beach. It's like a nice beach town. Um and we're closing on that because during covid we didn't know what was going to happen and we didn't we had a lot of buyers backing out mm -hmm. so one of our things was do we just need to raise money and just take down these properties ourselves yeah. right because we're still getting deals we know their deals um you know we might not be able to make a quick 10 to 15 on it but we got to pay the bills so do we just need to take it down ourselves put it on the market and then make the 15 on it, you know? Well, what's been crazy for us was that one of the best things about COVID was that we started buying more deals because right, we couldn't I saw sell. That. Yeah. So, I mean, we've done, we got one that we made 70 on, uh, one that uh, we're, we're closing in a couple of weeks that we, you know, we're making 60. 
like another one we're making a hundred and it's just like these are deals we would have wholesaled before right but because everyone's backing out i was like well the deals are still really good yeah there you go yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's awesome but man. that's yeah that's that's really cool to hear all right so um in the last year because i always ask like your favorite book but it's been a year in the past year what is what book have you gifted more than any other in the past year oh, or a man. favorite book um to be honest man i haven't really i haven't really read much yeah. in the last year um i would yeah have, haven't really read much in the last year how yeah. about a big lesson so but i would say though that one one of the things that drives me that has always stuck with me is the e-myth mm -hmm. right and obviously the book is awesome but it's the one thing that stuck with me in the e-myth was build your business like a franchise even if you're never going to franchise it out mm -hmm. right and i tell this to everybody right I tell this to my dad my dad owns restaurants right and i tell him like your goal shouldn't be to franchise yeah. if you don't want to but you should build it like a franchise um and that has driven me in my business um 100 you know i don't think we'll ever franchise it could be somewhere down in the path who knows yeah. um but i want to build it like like a franchise and that's going to continue to um to push me but i don't really read much to be honest i just listen to a lot of podcasts yeah um well, what's your favorite podcast besides disruptors obviously obviously <laughs> disruptors number one um so what, what one of the the biggest podcasts and i know this is going to sound weird because it's not really uh real estate related but i listen to a, a ton of joe rogan yeah and i listen to the different individuals that he interviews um and i compare their lives to my life in real estate and different things that they're doing um so just and, and he interviews some weird people mm -hmm. right and he's very so, he's got a very broad range he's not limited which is what i yeah, like yeah and and i like to listen to those things and see how they can apply in my business right um so so a big a big 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 lesson for me that i'm trying to do now more is when you're delegating you you forget that you need to lead from the front right and so it's hard to delegate because there's so much going on that is hard to delegate and still lead from the front. Mm -hmm. Like it's hard for me to coach my acquisition managers and still do acquisition calls while trying to sell the deals while managing employees and all that stuff, right? So one thing that I've recently been trying to do is get more involved with them. Um, and I, for, I forgot who it was that was, um, that was saying this on his podcast, um, but I found myself recently in the last month or so, ever since I heard that, just trying to you know hey this call i'm gonna do it and you're gonna listen to me mm -hmm. right um like just the other day I, we had to back out of a deal and my one of my acquisition managers was kind of scared on backing out of the deal because you know we we renegotiated the seller extended the deal and we still couldn't perform um so you got to back out right and you know obviously no one likes to talk about those things but mm -hmm. it's the reality of of, of wholesaling and uh, we had the buyer back out, so now we had to back out. And so, like, normally I just tell him, all right, back out, you know? But I could just feel that he wasn't comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I were to do that call, next time he'll be way more com yeah. confident, right? And I did the call, it was super easy. And he was just like, oh, that's it? And I was like, yeah, that's <laughs> it, you know? Um, so little things like that, I found myself that kept trying to do more of is leading from the front, which is hard. Yeah. Um, when you're the business owner Super and you're busy. trying to build the business, you don't have time to get on the phone with the seller, mm -hmm. you know, but I've been, you know, let, let me get on the phone with them. You know, I'll take over that call. Let, let, let me do it. Um, and so that was one of my biggest lessons recently, um, that I think I need to do more of. And it's just an excuse of, I don't have time to do it. It's just, mm -hmm. I just have to find the time, you know, and most calls, you know, it's going to be a five to 10 minute call anyway. You know, right. so it's in my head, like, I don't have time to do this. Like, let me just do the one call. Let me renegotiate the seller for my closer to listen. And then that is going to make a huge impact, not only in the ability for him to do it in the future, but also to trust me 
to trust me that I I can do this. You know, you're listening to me because I've done this. And yeah. You're listening to me because I'm smooth. I can, you know, I can get us out of any situation with the seller, with the buyer, whatever it is. You know, just the other day I had the whole disposition team and the transaction coordination team in the conference room with me talking and I was on speaker with the buyer um, cause the buyer was like mad at us mm-hmm. um, cause he found out like how much we were making and I had to kind of diffuse the situation and I had, you know, the disposition liaison who doesn't do any sales, but he wanted to listen to the call anyway. I had mm-hmm. the two disposition managers and our transaction coordinator and they were just listening to me in the conference room, you know? And so that's what I've, I'm trying to do more of and it's hard, but it is what it is. Oh, that's awesome. How about you? So he reads a shit ton. <laughs> so I read a shit ton. It's by Gonzalo Corzo. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it, it, it might sound t- typical, but my favorite book of all time is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Mm-hmm. And the reason it's my favorite book of all time is because before this, I built a pretty successful business. Um, it was a, a foreclosure maintenance business, uh, and I grew it to uh and i was a part of uh, you know i I ran field crews in eight states for these national companies and i had a lot going on we're doing about five million a year uh at our top and um you know i don't really have any college degrees um i don't have any educational you know whatever um to to brag about but i would go to these these yearly national seminars and conferences uh for my industry and you know, you know, either at the conferences or dinners afterward, I'd find myself at these tables with, you know, you know, 10 or 15 individuals. It's my clients and it's my competition, right? Mm-hmm. And my competition, um, these guys, you know, they've achieved things, you know, they, they've had their bachelors or masters in certain realms of education or whatever the case may be. Uh, another thing, I don't follow sports, you know, people talk about sports all the time. It's a conversational piece that just can get things going. And I don't do that. So, um, they're talking sports, um, they're talking about their achievements, whatever the case may be. And the one thing that was different between me and them is like, I'm like three times bigger than these people. Mm-hmm. So I would sit there thinking like, how am I even at this table and how am I beating these people out when they seem admirable? You know, they seem, uh, like people that should probably be 10 times my size. And I never really knew what I was doing. Um, and when, uh, and then also prior to that, I'd never really read any books and I wasn't in self development. I didn't really follow anyone. I really didn't really have any mentors. So when I started getting into self development and reading books and things like that, and I picked up Think or Grow Rich, it told me what it was that I didn't know what I had, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's the simplest thing you, you, you would ever think of. It's just, uh, it's persistence, mm-hmm. right? Think and Grow Rich told me that I had persistence. I had persistence more so than anyone around me or anyone that I've ever met, right? So this guy might be smarter, but I'm gonna outwork him and I'm gonna beat him. Uh, and if I can't do that now, I'll get better six months from now and right. then I'll persevere and I'll surpass Eventually him. I will win. Yeah, eventually I will win. Yeah. Um, so it's just my favorite book of all time. I've read it probably three, four times. Um, and then within the last year, uh, and I've read just, I don't know, a, a ton of books. Within the last year, though, I uh, probably read uh, Good to Great a couple times. Mm. Uh, I've read it three times in the past. I'm on my fourth time right now. And, and I find myself, I'll read new books, but I'll go back to the ones that really affected me or re- that I really took something from and I implemented things from it. And I'll learn new things from the rereads. Yeah, Jim Collins is great. He's, He's got a amazing. couple of books that are really good. Uh, but, last. Um, the thing about Think and Grow Rich, I think that there's two things here. Um, a, uh, the if I had just read that book alone and not read any of the books, I'd be just as fine because a lot of the other <laughs> books really just re saying yep. the same thing as Think and Grow Rich. And the second thing is, a lot of people can't finish that book, which is ironic because that book is about persistence. <laughs> right, right, right. So if you can't right. finish that book, <laughs> then you're probably not going to make That's it. That's funny, man. That's super um, funny. So I'm going to let you guys think about uh, uh, something you guys want to leave the listeners with, and I'll just make one quick announcement. Uh, guys, if you guys got value out of the show, please hit the like button. Please hit subscribe. It will help me a lot. It will help us create more millionaires. Um, and next week, we've got Jesse Burrell and Evil Dragunov. They're going to come back about how uh, they started as individual wholesalers. Been in teaming up, they've created something that's changed their lives. So, tune in next week. We got Jesse and Evo. 
They're going to talk about their journey together. Uh, so before we wrap up, last thoughts you want to leave the listeners So I, w- I would just say, you know, just to keep everything super simple, just be very ethical in everything that it is that you do. Um, be very straightforward with people. Um, one thing that I think our sales team does very well is they're straightforward with everyone that they talk to. They tell everyone exactly what it is that we're doing and how our process is going to go. Um, people have a sixth sense of figuring out if you're bullshitting them or not, Mm -hmm. right? So if you're trying to portray the deal in a different way that's not really how it's gonna get done, they're gonna not trust it, and that's probably why you're not getting deals, right? So that's that's just kind of what I'd like to leave everyone with. And how can someone get a hold of you? Uh, you know, Instagram, real Dom Felix, uh, Dominic Felix on, um, on Facebook. Um, and we do a, we do a wholesale show every Tuesday at 9 PM Eastern time. It's called the people's wholesalers. So you guys can go to Facebook and search the people's wholesalers and, and join the group. And it's free, obviously. Cool. Last thoughts. So last thoughts is if you want to make it in this industry or in general, you have to change your sphere of influence. Um, you have to change the people that you're talking to on a daily basis. You have to change the people that you look up to on a, on a daily basis. So I, I would say, you know, that has made me who I am today. It's, it's been the hard work and the action taking and, and all of that. But more than anything, it's been surrounding myself with people who are, you know, just crushing it in, in industries. And sometimes it, that takes money. You know, uh, yeah. um, it, it is what it is. You know, you buy yourself network. into the right room. Yeah, you got to buy yourself into the right room sometimes, and that's something that we've done. And every every time I I connect with somebody that's doing more than I am, it pushes me to to do more, and that in itself will get you to where you want to be way quicker than a bunch of other stuff. Um, you can work hard. You can. You can, you know, like, like, like what Dom said about his old business that he was with, right? Um, his, his business that he had in the past, he was at a table and it took him 10 years to get to be at those tables. And I think that, and he knows this, he could have got there sooner if he had surrounded himself with people who had been in, you know, in, in those, um, in that industry and it was a little bit of a different industry it's not like real estate where you can just listen to a podcast and mm-hmm. there's people sharing all their details on their of their business you know right. um and it was a different time but i feel like that's why we're we are where we are today is we are continuously in rooms where we're not the most successful person in the room you know we're we're, we're trying to become like the people that we're hanging out with um and that's something that as you grow and as you get more and more successful it becomes harder right because if you've never done a deal and you go to a networking event of real estate and the people have done three deals you're already somewhere Mm -hmm. right but now you know we're in jacksonville we're top dogs in in real in wholesaling um so it's hard to go into a room where people are doing more wholesale deals than us and so it's challenging ourselves to be in those rooms where you know people are doing 50 plus deals right and that's hard Mm -hmm. Uh, there's not a lot of people if there are people doing out there they're not talking about it no they're very quiet about it yeah they're very quiet about it um and so it's 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 a challenge right to get to those next levels um but i think that's the last thing that i want to leave people with because nobody really talks about that but that has been the biggest game changer for me you know when i was 18 i was shadowing millionaires you know and that's what made me who i am today um so change your sphere of influence stop hanging out with people who don't want to be as successful as you are and it is hard to do um it's probably the hardest thing that you are going to have to do in order to achieve success but it's going to get you to where you want to be yeah, yeah. and how do, how can someone get hold of you um so gonzalo corzo on facebook uh real gonzalo corzo on instagram just send me a message and let's connect awesome all right thank you guys Thank you all for watching. Yeah. Yeah. 
See, we real estate disruptors. Can't nobody touch us. And yeah, we about to give you game. Shout out to Steve Train. Real estate disruptors. They cannot touch us. And yeah, we about to give you game. Shout out to Steve Train. Jump on the Steve Train. We about to give you game. REI's flowing through my veins. And you don't have to look no further. See right here, you gon' learn everything. Yeah, see we real estate disruptors. 